just this last week, we counted seven new additional cases where uh, police officers are coming across machine guns, handguns, Glocks, 9 millimeters that are being converted into fully automatic machine guns. I found a couple of these incidents to be deeply, deeply concerning and uh, potentially very tragic. I had a, uh, several discussions with the United States Attorney's Office, and uh, I think we're on the same page. Uh, obviously, we have a mutual interest in um, educating the public. What we wanted to do is through you guys, we hope to deter future conduct. So if everybody understands or the public understands exactly uh, what these weapons can do and how dangerous they are, hopefully we can keep people from uh, engaging in the practice of using this type of device. Possession of a Glock diversion device is a uh, serious crime in and of itself. Just the possession of those items on the table, they're the plastic version of the converters. From my conversation with the U.S. Attorney, if you possess those items, I don't care if you have a converted gun or not, uh, we're going to look at the possibility of a conspiracy because those things have to move in a market. Uh, the federal government can take criminal conspiracies on any basis, and usually it's a drug-related matter, but this is, a, this is a different time and these are very dangerous circumstances. The biggest concern we have, as the bad guys escalate munitions on one side, you're going to get a political response uh, which will escalate munitions on the other side. It doesn't make any sense to anybody, certainly not in law enforcement. But you can understand going into a firefight, if you're faced with a machine gun, uh, what's the appropriate way to, to address that? The law in the federal system is very different than the law in the state system. Uh, simple possession of those items on that table, that can get you up to 10 years. Depending upon your background, the criminal history, it can get you up to 30 years. If you're twice, three times a felon, uh, you're looking at life as a career criminal. What we treat these devices at is, is uh, prohibitive offensive weapons. I can't do the same thing the feds can. They can prosecute on that, that basis alone. They can prosecute on ammunition alone. Since October last year, we've had seven cases that we're aware of. The ATF has partnered with the city of Pittsburgh police, and they're actively looking for these types of devices, and they're trying to take them out of the market. So this was the weapon that was taken from a defendant named Aaron Swan. Swan was involved with multiple major crimes including the murder of the chief of police, the attempted murder of another police officer, and the armed robbery of a couple in, in Brackenridge. That series of major crimes culminated in a firefight in Pittsburgh. Uh, unfortunately for Swan, the response by the Pittsburgh police was appropriate and final. I just want to refresh your memory as to what it sounded like during this firefight. The first volley was Swan shooting 11 times and then another 11 times. He had two police officers at two different positions. What he did is he was shooting at the one officer who was positioned behind a wall, and then he started shooting at another officer who had very little cover. He's behind a chain link fence. The second audio tape is the response that the Pittsburgh police had to the automatic weapon. You could see the vast difference in the amount of uh, firepower that the police were up against and, and what they had available to them. This is the ballistics evidence from ShotSpotter. All that evidence was developed in about 18 seconds. Uh, it took about four seconds for the machine gun to shoot 21, 22 times. Swan was dealing in weapons. And that bag right here, and you can see from this weapon, that's an extended clip. So all these weapons, they're, all of which were stolen or misplaced by the lawful owners, all of which have been modified so that they have additional firepower. Uh, recently, Naquan White was arrested. I don't want to get too much into the details of those, but he was taken off. When he was searched incident to arrest, uh, he, had, he had a fully automatic uh, Glock. Also, I'm going to bring to your attention a case involving a defendant named Javon Ship and another defendant named Dominic Lewis. Right now, those cases, my intention is to refer those to the federal government for prosecution. There's another case out of McKeesport. It's a rather serious case. Um, I had talked to the mayor of McKeesport, by the way, and they have ShotSpotter. Now, the advantage of having ShotSpotter, which the city of Pittsburgh has, is that in response to the existence of a machine gun, they'll know ahead of time before they get to the scene. So they can better equip themselves or better prepare themselves tactically if they're going to have to address that type of firepower. The most serious matter right now, in my mind, 
is what happened at Kennywood Park. Uh, this was back on September 24th of last year. That's a search warrant we executed on the 18th. I'm a little disappointed with the response that Kennywood has had. They're about a month out from opening up. This is a place that has to absolutely be safe. I want the public to know that. These are the security considerations, some of which have been addressed, some of which have not been addressed. The county police put a drone over Kennywood fairly recently. I wanted to orient you to the scene and to the surrounding rides. 837's behind you. That's the Music Express. Now you can see if that's the scene of a gunfight, you got 837 behind you, you've got the parking lot behind you. After the shooting took place, one of the shooters was here. There was another shooter over in this area. He had a 45. This shooter had the machine gun. When he left with the shooter with the machine gun, he got hit in the knee. It was a grazing wound to the left knee. He goes out this way towards a tunnel that takes you underneath 837 back to the parking lot. He dropped the gun along the way. Shooting area is right here. This is where people were shooting at the basketball court. This is the line to get into the Music Express. You got the pirate ship line back here. You got these guys in line to get onto the Phantom and the Noah's Ark obviously is behind you. Machine guns are very unstable in a sense that they're very difficult to control. They'll rise on you very easily. First of all, that's a children's ride. So they're encouraging little kids to be on that ride. At the time of the shooting, that ride was pretty much basically filled. This is an active day at Kennywood. That's daylight, one of the reasons we needed the warrant. And then nighttime. That's the crime scene. Again, just to orient you guys, you're maybe talking 15 to 20 feet where the shooter with the machine gun was. Shoots this way, return fire from that way with a 45. We didn't recover the 45. Hits the father of one of the, one of the kids that's on the ride. And the attended target was also hit, but was not killed. This is the weapon that was used. It's on the way to the tunnel. That could have caused a lot of damage. Now, when that weapon was fired, it was fired from underneath a shirt. And what happens is that it won't re-rack. It got caught in the clothing. So one shot got off. If that doesn't jam, I got 30 shots that could have went into that ride. That's just a very potentially tragic situation. Now, going, going out there on the 18th, with, and given the list of things, the demands we've made to, to make the park safer for everybody, this is one of the first things these guys saw. That's out to 837. They were speculating about how the weapons got onto campus. There's several different ways, obviously, you can do that. This is one of the areas that was most concerned to the county police, because obviously, you know, there's enough room to, for probably a person, skinny person, but a person to get through there but certainly you could put a weapon through there. I'm not sure that that's where the weapon came from or if it was even necessary to sneak a weapon in onto campus like that. Our experts who went out to assist Kenny Wood uh, found a lot of things that they thought needed to be done. When the Hughes family owned Kennywood Park, their mantra was the most beautiful music in the world is the sound of children laughing. On September 24th, you heard machine gun fire or you heard gunfire and you heard kids screaming. That's not what Kennywood Park is supposed to be like. On that table are the plastic devices. The metal versions of those go for about 500 to 1,000 bucks on the streets. So this is becoming disturbingly a trend. Cincinnati reports these types of devices being taken off every week by either the federal government through the ATF or, or Cincinnati PD. Indiana, the Midwest, this is, this is the toy of, uh, uh, of choice. Uh, we do not want that to come this way. We've always had a great relationship with the federal government. We refer gun cases on a regular basis to the federal government. Uh, this is a little different. This is something we have not faced, um, certainly during my tenure, uh, but we intend to get ahead of it.